You don't have to slam the progesterone receptor with trembolone, guys, or mint, or nandrolone, or metribolone, you know? Moderate approach, guys, the most sustainable, moderate approach that gives you the best longevity and the best possible blood work. Welcome to Vigorous PEDs with a little bit of biology sprinkled in here and there. I'm Coach Steve. Let's discuss all the anabolic pathways which you are completely neglecting. Now, don't get triggered. Don't press that dislike button just quite yet. It's going to be informative and it's going to give you alternative methods to keep your health intact. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. So let me give you guys a visual demonstration of what most guys in the enhanced uh, section of bodybuilding, CrossFit, strength sports, or just being enhanced with performance enhancing drugs in general. Let me give you guys a visual demonstration of what usually goes on. <clears throat> and that's completely overactivating the androgen receptor and body slamming <laughs> one of these pathways when there are several other pathways we can exhaust and optimize when we decide to take performance enhancing drugs. Now, of course, the androgen receptor is the most common pathway that we're all familiar with, so let's start there. But besides the androgen receptor, there's an estrogen receptor, a progesterone receptor, and mineral corticoid receptors and glucocorticoid receptors, which we can block to a certain extent. And then there's the growth hormone receptor, the insulin receptor, the IGF-1 receptor. There's many pathways we can exhaust to get the best possible blood work and use the lowest effective dose going forward. So let's go over the androgen receptor first. Now there's um, a wide variety of drugs we can choose from. We can choose from anabolic androgenic steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators. Those two categories are you know, generally where most of the performance enhancing drugs fall into. So we have testosterone derivatives, which we can first or differentiate into dehydrotestosterone derivatives or 19 nor derivatives whether those are uh, 17 alpha alkylated to help with bioavailability when we take them orally there's a wide variety of anabolic androgenic steroids to choose from and they all potentiate their effects predominantly through the androgen receptors now selective androgen receptor modulators are pretty comparable but I feel that selective is a little bit misleading here because they also work in androgen receptors, which are not found on skeletal muscle, just like steroids do, you know, traditional anabolic androgenic steroids. Now, when you compare SARMs to SERMs, SERMs are truly selective, whereas they act as an estrogen in certain parts of the body, whereas that the, the liver or bone or the uterus, while blocking the estrogen receptors in other parts of the body, like the hypothalamus, or the pituitary, or adipose tissue of the lower body, or breast tissue preventing gynecomastia. I'm trying to learn here, guys. I'm doing my best to pronounce all these words correctly. Gynecomastia. Let me know in the comment section if I got it correctly this time. So, serms are selective and very useful in certain cases when you're trying to get lean in a caloric deficit and you hold a little bit of body fat on your lower body while everywhere else you're absolutely shredded so if you want to get those uh, lean glutes serms might be required if you want to recover your hypothalamic pituitary testes axes or your you know, optimize your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis serms are required in most cases by blocking the estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus and the pituitary and of course if you have gynecomastia formation or symptoms in general SERMs are definitely a warm welcome because they can prevent the onset and the progression of gynecomastia. So, when you compare SERMs to SARMs, where do SARMs act as an anti-androgen? Nowhere, right? They're not very selective. You would assume that they're selective on skeletal muscle, but they increase liver enzymes and lower HDL, raise LDL, just the same as anabolic androgenic steroids do. Now, aldactone is an anti-androgen. Usually you see anti-androgenic properties after two or three days of continuous aldactone treatment. Now, that's very warm welcome for women suffering from acne. By taking spironolactone or aldactone, they're actually able to resolve some of their acne formation if that goes through the androgen receptor. But for the guys out there that are trying to stay anabolic AF, two or three days of aldactone is the maximum duration of um, aldactone, spironolactone treatment. I would advise as a bodybuilding coach, um, you know, putting a lot of people on stage, 
And of course, aldactone is used as a diuretic, um, but it's not the sole diuretic we can choose from. So use that sparingly because you're trying to stay as anabolic as possible. So considering that's not so much data on SARMs and a lot more data on AAS, knowing that anabolic androgenic steroids are not only able to activate the androgen receptor, whether that's on the membrane of the cell or the nuclear androgen receptor, which the membrane androgen receptor translocates once it's activated with an androgen into the nucleus, turns into a nuclear androgen receptor, and then starts transcribing all that sweet DNA into RNA. And now you have a little machine that pumps out protein. Whether those proteins are new androgen receptors, yeah, using a little bit of carnitine to get that pathway going and making you more anabolic in return. Because look at it logically, when an androgen receptor translocates from the membrane into the nucleus, it's gone, right? So you would expect a little bit of androgen receptor in return. And yes, androgens stimulate that pathway. So for every nuclear or membrane androgen receptor that's being activated by an androgen, you get a couple new androgen receptors in return. And if you're trying to optimize the androgen-mediated gene transcription and ensure you have the highest density of androgen receptors on the cell membrane or the highest androgen receptor content in the nucleus, make sure you stay on top of your carnitine intake. If you go with oral, I can highly suggest Gorlamide AR, discount code down below. And if you go with the injectable carnitine, ideally you go with pharmaceutical. So make sure you stay on top of your carnitine intake whenever you decide to stimulate the androgen receptor pathway with anabolic steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators. Now, zinc and selenium also contributes to androgen-mediated gene transcription, so make sure you get a little bit of selenium and zinc from your diet or supplementation as well. Uniquely to specific anabolic androgenic steroids, some of them have different affinities for different receptors as well. Now, as we're all familiar with the 19 nors, the progestogenic compound, as the name implies, they activate the progesterone receptor to a certain extent. Now, most of the anabolic androgenic steroids don't really activate the estrogen receptor. There's some limited data out there that nandrolone and oxymetolone both activate the estrogen receptors in breast tissue. Well, whether that comes from tremendously elevated estradiol concentrations or these compounds actually activate the estrogen receptors in specific tissues, that remains to be investigated. Now, progesterogenic compounds, it's been investigated that they have, you know, binding affinity for the progesterone receptors to a certain extent. And it highly depends on which compounds you choose, where those binding affinities are higher than progesterone or lower. Now, through the progesterone receptor, you can get a little bit of anabolism as well. That's why nandrolone, mint, trenbolone are considerably more anabolic than testosterone is, which only goes to the androgen receptor. So keep that in mind, you can stimulate the progesterone receptor to a certain extent, but you have to keep in mind that progesterone receptors are also available on the pituitary gland. And of course, when progesterone receptors are stimulated in the pituitary gland, prolactin secretion goes up, which could be, um, you know, not so good for your overall sex drive, erectile function, or gynecomastia. Again, guys, trying to pronounce it correctly. So if you're going with a progestogenic compound, I would stick with the lowest effective dose. And it highly depends on which compounds you choose, what that lowest effective dose is going to be, because they all have different binding affinities for the progesterone receptor. Now, some of these compounds, some of the 19 nors or the more potent anabolic androgenic steroids, they also block the mineral corticoid receptor or the glucocorticoid receptors. Now, besides halotestin and aldactone, which are both FDA-approved and used in certain medical conditions, there's a couple other compounds out there with reasonably high affinity for the mineral corticoid receptor and the glucocorticoid receptor. Now, most of these compounds were never marketed or completely discontinued, but you know the underground scene. If there's a chemical structure for it, there's probably a raw ingredient provider out there as well. So some of them might still be able to be purchased, but considering the high affinity for the progesterone receptor acting as a progesterone and a high affinity for the glucocorticoid or the mineral corticoid receptor actually blocking mineral corticoids or glucocorticoid steroids at the receptor site. 
that might be um, a little bit too powerful on a milligram for milligram basis. So let's analyze the compounds which are readily available and actually used in medical settings or commonly used by bodybuilders or other fitness enthusiasts which are enhanced. Trembolone has moderate affinity for the glucocorticoid receptor that has been investigated, which is where some of its unique and pronounced anabolic effect is coming from. By having a little bit of affinity for the glucocorticoid receptor, it's able to block cortisol and other glucocorticoids from attaching and inhibits muscle protein breakdown that way. Now, uniquely to halotestin, which has chemical similarities to corticosteroids, allowing it to bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, and could either act as a corticosteroid or prevent other corticosteroids from binding to the same receptor. So there's a little bit of competitive binding going on here and could potentially lower the effect of corticoid steroids, which would otherwise result in muscle protein breakdown. So that's potentially where some of the anabolic benefits from halo testing comes from. But of course, since it's so chemically similar, it is also known to inhibit certain enzymes, which actually contribute to metabolism of mineral corticoids or corticoid steroids, raising certain concentrations in the bloodstream, which results in higher blood pressure, for example, so or, or water retention. So keep that in mind. There are some unique characteristics to halo testin, which acts through the mineral corticoid and the glucocorticoid pathways you know, resulting in some tremendous side effects and, of course, you know, a higher anabolic state that you're in. But it's a not very sustainable approach. So that's why we usually use halotestin at the end of a contest prep, allowing it to preserve or actually build so much additional muscle tissue in a caloric deficit and prevent some of the corticosteroids from um, reducing protein metabolism or, you know, causing muscle protein breakdown especially when that's in combination with Trembolone, so that's a pretty potent co uh, combination. But halotestin is not very sustainable, being it's so uh, you know, potent on liver enzymes and overall health. But Trembolone is probably the most sustainable compound that can be run for several weeks at a time. I would limit Trembolone exposure to eight weeks, guys, and only in situations when you're in a caloric deficit. Because again, you're trying to prevent muscle protein breakdown by inhibiting the glucocorticoid receptors and promoting anabolism to the progesterone receptor and, of course, the androgen receptor. Now, besides activating the androgen receptor directly, there's another pathway involved here, which goes through the sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex, which is able to deliver androgens to tissue and can then activate the nuclear androgen receptor as well. So keep your sex hormone binding globulin in the middle of the range and consider that the postman of all the androgenic compounds that you're taking, having sex hormone binding globulin too low doesn't optimize androgen delivery and having them too high only impacts sex drive. Now, anything over super physiological dosages of testosterone will lower your sex hormone binding globulin automatically, no matter how high you keep your estrogen or any other, you know, um, proactive approach you can incorporate to keep your sex hormone binding globulin reasonably high. Consider sex hormone binding globulin the postman delivering androgens to tissues. Try to keep it over 20 nanomoles per liter. If it crushes a little bit lower, it's probably because your estrogen is too low. And of course, estrogen has moderate anabolic effects as well. So you're trying to keep all these hormones at least optimal so you don't miss out on the estrogen receptor mediated anabolism or sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex mediated anabolism by activating the nuclear androgen receptors. So again, it's all these pathways contribute and how much net gain you would get on top of the traditional androgen receptor pathway that has to be investigated. But I would say every pathway contributes another five to 10%. So why not exhaust them? Because of course it's the androgens that contribute to negative side effects. So if we can deliver androgen androgens through the sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex and activate the androgen uh, receptor in the nucleus that way and keep estrogen somewhere at the top of the range or we use uh, ectosteroids or phytoectosteroids in the form of turkesterone to potentiate some anabolism through the estrogen beta receptor and get a little bit of more anabolism on top, of a moderate dose of anabolic androgenic steroids, 
why not? Right? Why not? I mean, torgesterone and ectosteroids, there's not really a lot of data that shows that it's deleterious to your health effects on a milligram for milligram basis compared to some of the anabolics that we're taking, you know, in pretty high dosages sometimes. So why not exhaust that pathway? Keep your estrogen at the top of the reference range or slightly over the reference range. Consider taking some of the ectosteroids or torgesterone to promote estrogen beta receptor mediated anabolism further keep progesterone somewhere in the middle of the reference range whether that's actual progesterone by supplementing pregnenolone in which converts into progesterone downstream or you use acg or hmg on cycle to keep your hpta and hpaa somewhat active and produce a certain amount of progesterone or you take micronus progesterone sublingually or orally Sublingually is a much lower dose than oral micronized progesterone because it has very poor oral bioavailability. Or again, you trickle the uh, progesterone receptor with 19 nors. There's many different pathways you can choose from or many different methods to help keep that progesterone receptor activity and mediated anabolism intact. Now, besides all these compounds, the neurosteroids, the ACG, the HMG, the anabolic steroids, the selective androgen receptor modulators, the ectosteroids, the phytoectosteroids, the turkesterone, etc. You know, certain compounds that inhibit the mineral corticoid receptor or the glucocorticoid receptors. We can also exhaust the growth hormone receptor pathway or the insulin receptor pathway or the IGF-1 receptor pathway. Now, growth hormone for most people is going to be the first step in optimizing all the anabolic pathways that we can choose from you can either optimize your own growth hormone production, which is, um, you know, a video in itself. I have a whole ebook dedicated, well, not the entire ebook, but a large part of the ebook is dedicated on how to optimize natural growth hormone secretion by following certain diet practices and excluding certain supplements or compounds which were shown to inhibit growth hormone secretion. Really, you don't have to take exogenous growth hormone just to have favorable growth hormone concentrations. And of course, favorable growth hormone concentrations, whether that's from endogenous or exogenous use, will be favorable for your serum IGF-1 concentrations as well, because it's predominantly the growth hormone that determines IGF-1 secretion. Up until a certain extent, your liver can only produce so much. And if you're not happy with your serum IGF-1 concentrations, regardless of the growth hormone concentration that you're taking, you might have to use exogenous IGF-1 or an IGF-1-like peptide like IGF-1-LR3 or IGF-1-DES, which are modified version of insulin-like growth factor 1. So they're not 100% bioidentical, but they're close enough and they, you know, it's mostly contributes to their active life. So IGF-1-LR3 has a long active life. And igf one des has a relatively short active life, just like uh, pigelated mechanical growth factor has a longer active life than conventional mechanical growth factor, even though, you know, the results are a bit wishy-washy. And whether that's individual response or, you know, quality of product, it's a little bit difficult to determine at this point because I would say one out of 10 people that I know used pigelated MGF, they got good results. So whether that's the, the the MGF pathway or the product quality, I'm not exactly sure. I go in depth in the ebook as well. Consider giving that section a read if you have access to pigulated MGF, because again, the results that uh, you know most people get are not that astronomical, comparing it to IGF one LR three or IGF one DES from what I've seen. So those are pathways you can exhaust. IGF-1 has moderate affinity for the insulin receptors and insulin has moderate affinity for the IGF-1 receptor. That's why you get some IGF-1-like effects when you take exogenous insulin and you get some insulin-like effects when you take exogenous IGF-1 or you raise your IGF-1 by increasing your exogenous growth hormone intake. Man, all these medical terms, I'm sure I stumbled up here and there. Excuse me, guys. It's... um, a mouthful sometimes. So you have the growth hormone receptor pathway, the IGF-1, the insulin receptor pathways, which can all be exhausted or optimized by either raising your endogenous production or using exogenous GH, IGF-1, or insulin. So we have several different pathways. Let's summarize a little bit at the end. We have the androgen receptor 
pathway, make sure you stay on top of your carnitine, zinc, and selenium. If you decide to incorporate exogenous compounds to exhaust and optimize this pathway, then we have the progesterone receptor pathway. Again, there's exogenous compounds. You can choose one from or simply keeping your serum progesterone concentration somewhat in the range because progesterone has a much higher affinity for the progesterone receptor than most of the compounds, most of the 19 nors that we get to choose from. So, you know, progesterone at the middle bottom of the reference range is exhausting that anabolic pathway already. You don't have to slam the progesterone receptor with trembolone, guys, or mint, or nandrolone, or metribolone, you know? Moderate approach, guys, the most sustainable moderate approach that gives you the best longevity and the best possible blood work. The estrogen receptor, by either minimizing the aromatized inhibitors that you're taking, and whatever protocol you need to follow, whether that's frequent injections or less frequent injections, keep your estradiol at the top of the reference range so you get some anabolism through the estrogen alpha and beta receptor pathway. You can stimulate the estrogen beta receptor pathway a little bit further with ectosteroids or tergesterone. Inhibit the mineral corticoid or the glucocorticoid receptor. There's limited data out there. Trembolone is probably the most sustainable approach, even though the side effects uh, might be severe. The side effects are intolerable for me, so I decide not to take that. Keep in mind that most of the anabolic androgenic steroids and perhaps some of the SARMs have a moderate blocking effect on the mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid receptors. So you get some inhibition of muscle protein breakdown through that pathway already. Exogenous growth hormone, exogenous insulin, exogenous IGF-1. Man, that's seven pathways we can choose from. Actually, there's an eighth pathway being the sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex. And all of these can be overwritten with proper nutrition. Because without proper nutrition, none of these will work correctly. Keep that in mind, guys. Vigorous crew, much love. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find those ebooks on my website vigorsteve.com slash shop if you're looking for personalized advice you can find the rates to my services in the services section as well contact me if you're interested thank you guys so much for watching follow me on instagram at vigorsteve before i forget and i'll see you in the next video